Welcome to Lecture 2.3, Health Information Management and Accreditation, Regulation, and HIPAA. The objectives for this lecture are defining accreditation and regulation, reviewing regulatory agencies, the importance of accreditation, understanding the bigger HIPAA picture, woohoo! discuss federal, corporate, and facility compliance, and the role of HIT accreditation and regulation and HIPAA. So healthcare facilities and practitioners are licensed and regulated by federal, state, and local agencies. They're also self-regulated, which is their voluntary participation in accrediting agencies. Governments influence healthcare delivery in two ways, permits and licensure for operation and rules for reimbursement. Licensure and permits are mandatory to do business. It's like an inspection by the health department in order to have a kitchen that serves food to the public, okay? It's mandatory. You have to have a business license in order to do business. Federal licenses include things such as the Federal Food and Drug Administration, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Office of Civil Rights. National licensures also include things such as nurses who have to take an NCLEX or a national test. And then there's also local and state um, employee licensures such as pharmacists, physicians, respiratory therapists, radiology technicians, all of them have particular standards and accreditation certificates that they need to maintain and have in order to be able to be employed in the jobs that they do. There's also other license and permits such as electrical permits, boiler permits, everything that has to do with safety standards, facility standards, and individual department standards. So laboratories, radiology departments have to have particular permits and licensures by state and local governments in order for them to be open to do business. Different facilities also require different types of licensures. Nursing homes have different licensures and standards than, say, a pharmacy does, etc. Again, accreditation is voluntary. However, it's very necessary. It's necessary because the facility can advertise that they're accredited or certified. We'll see a little bit more of this on the next slides, but I want you to think about the reasons why some of you want to take a health information technology certificate course. You all will have the same level of knowledge in information systems management. However, if it was you and another person with the same type of education and experience up for a job in a healthcare facility and you have a healthcare information technology certificate, then that is something that you want to advertise. It makes you more desirable than the other person. That is the same thing with a voluntary accreditation. It's not required, but it's very necessary in order to be able to advertise and maintain employees and to offer patient services and to acquire patients to take on those services. Joint Commission is the accreditation that allows for Medicare and Medicaid to be billed. It's not the only organization, but being accredited with Joint Commission allows this type of billing to take place without subjecting the facility to additional audits and inspections. Other regulatory requirements result around the reporting. There's legal issues such as child abuse, partner assaults, gunshots and weapons assaults, and additional statistical reporting. So there's infectious diseases. The Office of Vital Statistics wants to know births and deaths. The state of Montana has a trauma registrar that wants to have reports submitted based on the type of traumas that are seen in hospitals and outlying facilities. And there's even a cancer tumor registry. So if particular tumors or types of cancer are found, then they want to keep track of this information. Again, it's related to public health. In high tech, we need to be able to do quality efficient, timely and equitable reporting of this data. Does that sound familiar? Four of the six quality indicators and initiatives. 
High Tech has to be able to interface with these federal, state, and local agencies for this reporting. The methods of reporting, how it will be disseminated, the look of the report, as well as is it scheduled versus an on-demand report. This information also needs to be transmitted securely, whether that's encrypted, using a file transfer protocol, whether the agency has VPN or point, server point-to-point -point access in order for them to acquire the data themselves. Established in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid are governed by the federal agency of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which resides under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you recall from earlier lectures, we talked about how CMS and Joint Commission work together for regulating hospitals. Medicare provides health care coverage for people that are over the age of 65, as well as if they have disabilities or end-stage renal disease. It's federally funded. That's the most important thing about Medicare, is it's federally funded. Medicaid is mostly state-funded. Medicaid is mostly state-funded. Medicaid provides health care benefits for people who are poor, blind, have other disabilities, are pregnant, 65 or over, in addition to Medicare. We talked a lot about the aging population and how it's an exponential growth and the impact that's having on health care costs as well as on Medicare. Now I just mentioned that we had disabilities, medical conditions, pregnancies, terminal illnesses that all fall under Medicare and Medicaid. So I want you to think even, even if we weren't having the baby boomers age and the people over 65 growing, increasing in number exponentially, the population as a whole still has a large percentage that is dependent on Medicare and Medicaid services for their health care, which is why it is so important for an organization to be able to bill Medicare Medicaid services. But remember, if they aren't accredited, then they cannot bill. So how does CMS influence healthcare delivery? Since the beginning, Medicare has required utilization reviews or utilization management, how health-related services are being used. This continues even if certain healthcare-related services or supplies are not billable, Medicare wants the use of these services and supplies to be reported. Some examples of these are durable medical equipment, um, additional supplies that we might not bill individually for, such as ACE bandages, but we're using them to take care of the patient. CMS wants to know because that's how they're going to manage their resources and strategically plan for how much money they're going to pay for services in the future. It establishes rates for individual services in an effort to control health care costs. By law, providers cannot collect more from a Medicare patient than the approved amount. Many health insurance plans have adopted the same practice and enter into a contractual agreement that patients will not be charged more than the amount approved by the plan. So again, CMS came up with the standardization of what they were going to pay and third-party private pay insurances are adopting the same standards. Again, why is it so important for a healthcare facility to adopt those standards? It's what everyone is billing on or reimbursing on. Prospective pay systems relate to inpatient stays. It's the fixed amount based on the type of case, reason for admission, diagnosis, and comorbidities. Remember we talked about this earlier when we talked about prospective pay and diagnosis related groups why it is so important to collect accurate data and be able to report that data on the diagnosis of the patient and their other comorbidities in order to guarantee maximum reimbursement. In an effort to ensure quality of care, rules and standards are being established as a condition of participation or a COP. 
Facilities are subject to audits and inspections, and Medicare recognizes other agencies as being that intermediary um, to offer this accreditation. These organizations have a deemed status. So thereby, if a facility is accredited with a Medicare-recognized organization, such as Joint Commission, or JCO, then the facility has the deemed status and the Joint Commission accreditation passes the organization from other audits and inspections. So by being accredited with one organization, such as Joint Commission, then the facility is not subject to additional audits and inspections. That's huge when we talk about costs and efficiencies. It takes a lot of resources when these surveys happen with Joint Commission and other accrediting organizations in the sense of people, there's extra people involved, employees that are gathering and collecting data that are sort of babysitting Joint Commission while they're here, making sure they have what they need. And so if, it, in, if this happened regularly with different organizations and different audits and inspections taking place all of the time, it would be very costly for an organization to keep up with all of those inspections. So by being affiliated or accredited with one organization that passes a facility on all of the other credentialing they need and standards, it's much more efficient. CMS also plays a big part in HIPAA electronic standards and adoption and enforcement. Centers for Medicaid Services put pressure on local agencies, the, the third party intermediaries for Medicare to adopt these electronic standards. Thereby, CMS also has the right to enforce HIPAA. Very important. So what is the influence of Joint Commission on healthcare? So we talked about the Centers for Medicaid Services. What about Joint Commission? Joint Commission was created by the American College of Surgeons and was originally called the Hospital Standards Program evolving into Joint Commission of Hospitals. In the late 1980s, the Joint Commission of Hospitals began accrediting other types of facilities, not just hospitals, so nursing homes, pharmacies, and so they changed their name to the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or what some of you may know as JACO, J-C-A-H-O. It's now currently shortened to Joint Commission. Joint Commission addresses the level of performance in key functional areas like patients' rights, treatment, and infection control. CMS works very closely with Joint Commission to ensure that the agency and Joint Commission's performance measures are precisely aligned. That's why you often hear them go together. Again, the role of HIT is assisting with the application design for quality input, the training, implementation, workflow analysis, all of this to ensure quality da data capture. Remember, quality, because if we had good data capture and we have regulatory required data item items and elements, then we can do quality reporting, which is necessary in order for our facility to maintain their voluntary accreditation status. A couple of other recognized organizations, although there's more than just these two, are the College of American Pathologists, known as CAP, and the Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Facilities, or CARF. The goal of the College of American Pathologists is to improve patient safety by advancing the quality of pathology and laboratory services through education, standards setting, and ensuring laboratories meet or exceed regulatory requirements. The College of American Pathologists is not limited to the physical area of the lab department. This is very important. The College of American Pathologists is not limited to the confines of the four walls that within the lab department. It also governs nurses and other healthcare professionals who are using devices, and remember a device is a technology, to do point of care testing and other lab testing. So there's things, glucometers, they do bedside ABGs, bedside troponins on cardiac patients, 
All of those happen outside the lab, but the College of American Pathologists governs the quality and standards of those procedures. The Commission on Accreditation of Rehab Facilities is more consultative than inspective. Um, it covers a wide variety of rehab services that I have listed there. And it works very closely with Joint Commission to offer coordinated surveys for facilities that would like accreditation in both Joint Commission and in CARF. Now again, that's very important. If you remember, I just said it takes a lot of resources to go through these accrediting surveys and inspections and application process. So by CARF working closely with Joint Commission, they coordinate to have a one-time survey that meets both needs of the, both those organizations. So it's much more cost effective for the organization. So again, why would we want to have voluntary accreditation? Again, it all has to do with quality, timeliness, efficiency, safety, equity, patient-centeredness, and effective. All of those six quality initiatives strengthen a community's confidence. If you have a certification that says you're good at what you do, then a patient's more likely to come to you for service. It provides a competitive edge, again, you're more likely to come to this facility for service. And then a competitive edge for employees as well. We call it magnet status in some, some bigger hospitals. They try to achieve a certain level. If you have patients that are satisf satisfied, your reimbursements are higher, your employee satisfaction is higher, it's a place that you want to work. Improves risk management and risk reduction. If you are following standards for accreditation, those standards were designed and built around safety protocols and safety standards to improve quality. So if you are following the standards of accreditation, you are naturally going to have risk reduction. Provides education and good practices for improving business operations. Enhances staff recruitment and development. As I mentioned, it's a state, goes along with the competitive edge in a marketplace. It's recognized by select insurers and third parties. So if you are accredited, you're sort of given a, a, a pass for additional harassment, so to speak, by an insurance company. An insurance company that knows you're accredited in, say, orthopedic surgeries is less likely to question why you're billing a patient for particular services or supplies they already know that you're following a certain standard therefore they're less likely to question every time an insurance claim questions why it has been billed by a facility it requires resources in order to prove or verify the need for billing for those services and that all takes time and anytime you use more resources it becomes more expensive for the organization also, it re may re fulfill regulatory requirements in other select states. Again, there are standards that these accreditation organizations are following. And if you're meeting their high standards, then it's almost a given you've met standards there in place that local um, and state agencies are that are requiring that of a facility. So what is the bigger picture of HIPAA? HIPAA was originally intended to accomplish Improving the portability and continuity of health insurance, as we talked about, when people lose their jobs. Combat waste, fraud, and abuse. Promote use of medical savings accounts. Improve access to long-term care. And simplify administration of health insurance. The section we're most familiar with is the administrative simplification subsection. This is where health plans are covered, clearinghouses, health care providers, your job and behavior. A clearinghouse is the intermediary between a health care provider and a health plan or insurance. Clearinghouses receive claims from the provider, process and forward these claims to the health plan. They receive responses from the health plan and then they process these responses and send them back to the provider. This function is technically called a switch. It's very important because HIPAA defines a clearinghouse as converting the data arriving in a non-compliant format into a HIPAA compliant format. However, these clearinghouses do both. 
they're working with that data to convert it into compliant formats, but then they're also acting as the intermediary between the communication of the provider and the health plan. It makes it much easier, and again, if it's easier and more efficient, then it's less costly for a facility or organization to have one point of contact to submit all of their claims than to have to submit their individual electronic medial claims to a variety of different places. So what is this administrative simplification subsection? Well, it has four distinct components. There are transactions and code sets, uniform identifiers, privacy, and security. ICD-9, ICD-10, ICD-11, which I've heard is coming, are the international classification of disease, that's the ICD, with clinical modifiers, that's the CM. ICDs, or international classification of diseases, are diagnosis codes such as diabetes, congestive heart failure, and ankle fracture. Those are all diagnoses. They also contain subcodes and multiple codes that can be used for the same visit. That's what the modifiers are for. And again, you can have multiple diagnoses. Remember, a person that has a primary diagnosis of diabetes can be treated for a frank fractured ankle, but because diabetics are at risk for poor circulation in the extremities, it's very important to have both the diagnoses listed. One is their primary, because it's what stays with them, what they have all the time. Diabetes isn't going away. And then the ankle fracture is a secondary diagnosis. It's the reason for their treatment at this moment in time. It changes the potential severity or risk for complications related to that simple ankle fracture. HCPCS -HC or HCPCS um, consists of two levels. The first is the CPT code, which is a procedure code. CPT stands for Current Procedural Terminology. These codes, the CPT codes, are maintained by the American Medical Association, the AMA. Level 2 of the HCPCS -HC code is used to report other products, supplies, and services that are, are not included in the current procedural terminology or CPT code. Now this is really important. Uh, an example of this is what we refer to as durable medical equipment. So when you um, have a fractured ankle, there is a CPT code for splinting of the lower extremity. That includes the the procedure of a healthcare provider um, wrapping your ankle and putting some kind of splint on it. It includes the gauze and ACE bandages and that kind of thing. Those are not billed separately. However, the crutches are called durable medical equipment. They're long lasting. They're not disposable. Those are usually managed by a third party vendor, not by the organization. So the third party vendor brings in the crutches. They're stored in the organization. The organization disseminates the crutches to those who need them. And then they fill out forms that the the vendor that supplies the crutches bill the patient for separately from the hospital or organizational bill. It's kind of complicated. Um, uniform identifiers are used in the for the providers, and examples of these are the NPI or National Provider Identifier. The EI, which is the employee identifier number, which is used to identify employee-sponsored health insurance. And then there's the NHPI, which is the National um, Health Provider Identifier, and that's coming out in the future. Privacy is all forms of protected health information, including paper, images, and electronic. Security is only the electronic forms of health 
protected health information, and that's important. Privacy is all forms of protected health information, or PHI. Security is specific to the electronic protected health information. So privacy, we keep hearing so much about privacy. We could talk a whole lecture, a whole week on just HIPAA, but we're not. We talk a lot about it, and um, so let's, let's get a little bit of detail, and then maybe we won't have to do anything but mention it in the future. So we've talked before how HIPAA legislation, there were no laws preventing employees from asking health care providers for dis or health from disclosing your health information. For an example, they could call and say, ask your employer, um, an employee, potential employer could call and ask your healthcare provider if you've ever had a back injury. There was nothing to prevent them from doing, asking the question and nothing preventing your healthcare provider from answering the question. Um, marketing and advertising could call and ask a facility for, um, that they were doing some kind of promotion on, on diabetes um, devices or awareness and would like to have the mailing addresses of all your diabetic patients. There was nothing preventing them from asking and nothing preventing from um, the health care provider from giving them all of those names and addresses. So privacy rule is for patients identifiable health information or PHI in whatever form it exists. Remember I just said it's paper or electronic. For the first time, there is a foundation for federal protection, but it does not replace other federal, state, or local laws, and facilities are free to adopt more protective policies and practices as they see fit. So HIPAA just sets the minimum. Privacy consists of disclosing, disclosing a privacy policy of the organization and providing an informed consent. These informed consents permit the sharing of protected health information for the purposes of treatment, including consults, purposes of reimbursement activities, and to promote the continuity of care. Once a consent is signed, once a consent is signed, there is no requirement for further permission from the parent, patient or legal representative. The thing to remember is how they talk about personal health, you know, protected health information that's identifiable. So we hear a lot about employees and getting in trouble for HIPAA, particularly in hospitals. Remember, you may be discussing a situation. You're not using a name. You're not using a date of birth. Anything that you would reclassify as identifiable. However, However, if an individual can be identified, it violates HIPAA. So here's an example. If you're like a respiratory therapist and you're sitting at a Starbucks having a conversation with your friend in Podunk, Montana, population 1000, and you're talking to your friend about a great new kind of treatment for a, that you're using on a burn victim, that had chemical um, burns in their lungs, inhalation burns, secondary to a meth lab explosion. And that although the treatment's going well, the patient's not gonna make it, probably. Chances are, if you're in Podunk, Montana, population of 1,000, and you're discussing a patient that was involved in a meth lab explosion, everybody in the community, everybody sitting around you in that Starbucks, probably knows who you're talking about. They may even know the patient's name themselves because it's probably been on the news. You have violated HIPAA because you are talking about something, even though you use no date, no date of birth, you have provided enough information to identify who you are talking about. That is very important. So,
Authorization requires um, additional permission. Authorization is signed by the patient or legal representative. An example of when you would use an additional authorization form as opposed to your informed consent. Remember we talked about informed consent one time is for that visit, complete visit. An example would be if you needed your lab results um, for a particular job, say like your drug screen or something. Those require an authorization for those results to be given to your potential employer. Those results are not being used to provide continuity of care of you, to take care of you, to consult in your health care, to make the best decision for you. It's because of employment. If the lab results contain information about a particular liver problem, there's no authorization needed for the lab pathologist to call a liver specialist to consult with. But you do need an authorization to give those results to an employer. Does that make sense? Do you understand the difference there? Where a consent, you're consulting, you're using the information across a continuum of care to provide care where an authorization is more of a request to have the information that is not required in order to take care of the patient. The authorization must contain a signature, the date it was signed, an expiration date, to whom the information is to be disclosed, disclosed to, and exactly what is to be disclosed. If you ever see one of these forms, it may say, do you want x-rays, labs, entire medical record? You have the ability to check only the information that you want to disclose. It also needs to know what the purpose of the information will be used. A new authorization is needed for each separate disclosure. Okay, so if you get one set of labs, maybe you're applying to the Air Force, the Army, and the National Guard, or I guess the Army and National Guard might be together, Air Force, Army, and the Marines. You would need three separate authorizations in order to provide those results to three separate branches of the military. Okay? Remember, with we talked, I said there's a, a little bit of an exception when it comes to HIPAA and research. So an authorization is usually required when research is involved particularly if the participation is in a clinical trial. However, if a research study is submitted to an internal review board, an IRB, and it is approved, then there are standards and regulations around the minimum information necessary to perform and collect the data for the research. And oftentimes, there is no additional authorization required Again, the information may be considered identifiable because you have a race, a date of birth, um, some things that could be considered identifiable, but you're usually working with large pools of data like all the diabetic patients. What you need to know is their date range, age range, um, which is where the date of birth comes in. You need to know their sex and their gender and their race because that can play a, a part in qualifying the data but it's not identifiable, you're not looking um, for names, you're not being given names of the patients, you're not giving their addresses. You may be, re because of doing um, studies like what William Farr did with the populations and doing public health, you may be given a relative location, um, but unless uh, an address or location is required to do your study, you're not going to have access to that particular information about patients. So then there's security, and how does privacy and security differ from one another? Security has two primary purposes. <clears throat> security safeguards, and then the allowing the particular appropriate access. Um, while still providing protection, okay? 
There are three categories for this. There's administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, and technical safeguards. There's a, a lot of information related just to security. And remember, security has to do with the electronic protected health information, just the electronic. And I really encourage you to refer to the HIPAA security standards matrix, which I'll, I'll post in the resources. And there's also a website here from HIMSS that you can go to, to to see what this matrix looks like. And I really encourage you to, to get a feel for it because it's primarily the reasons behind high tech. It's what a health information technologist person would do to meet all these security standards. Um, security safeguards protect the electronic information that might be at risk. It allows appropriate access, which is the use of logins and passwords by healthcare providers and the ability to associate a relationship or role-based permissions. So not all nurses have the same access as other nurses, or you might be a care management nurse versus a bedside clinical nurse. The three categories, administrative, is the assignment or delegation of security responsibility to an individual. It is for security training requirements, audit reporting, and monitoring for the appropriate access. So this is a person that is monitoring safeguards. That's administrative. Physical are the mechanisms required to protect the electronic systems from the environment hazards, such as having your Halon system installed, unauthorized intrusions with your, with your backups, firewalls, the type of storage equipment, the physical storage equipment, whether it's in a SAN array, um, whether it's virtualized server, access to the physical data center, so your, your actual data center may have locks that only certain people are allowed to get into that room. Technical is the automated processes to protect and control access to data. It's the authentication controls, the encrypting and decryption of data. It's, it's automating the passwords to expire every 90 days. That is all technical. And again, there's this entire matrix. So how can HIT help? Performing risk analysis. Where are the weak points in the security? Workstation use security and device media controls. Um, such as domain, domain authentication controls and group policy controls that prevent an individual from surfing the net, such as community medical center, you can't get on Facebook. Things that would prevent you from getting Trojans, viruses, worms, phishing. Hardware disposal, how are you, main, how are you getting rid of old hard drives and destroying things that may have sensitive data on them? Wiping systems before you're reallocating that, that PC or that laptop again. Backups, storage, network strengths, domain controls, assisting with contingency plans and disaster recovery, the isolation of clearinghouse computers from other systems in the organization. All of these are health information technology processes and requirements. <clears throat> so what is compliance? Compliance is a facility-wide system of policies, procedures, and guidelines that help ensure ethical business practices. Compliance. These policies and procedures include ethical statements, commitment to compliance, leadership policies, and ways employees can report unethical and compliant, non-compliant occurrences, usually encouraged to be done anonymously so they don't feel any threat. Also, there's compliance and professional standards, and these come in the form of code of ethics. And here on the slide, I've listed some organizations and some of their websites. There's the American Nurses Association, the ANA, the American Medical Association, which has the code of ethics for physicians, the AMA. There is the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA, which does information technology, in health information management. There is HITSEP, which is the Health Information Technical Standards Panel, and both AHIMA and HITSEP have um, codes of ethics that would qualify for individuals who are interested specifically in health information technologies. So in summary, regulatory is required. 
accreditation is voluntary. Regulatory agencies can be federal, state, or local. Accreditation affects marketing quality and reimbursement. If you're accredited, you can be reimbursed by particular insurance carriers such as Medicare, Medicaid, and you can market both to employees, to recruit employees, and also to recruit patients. <coughs> The most commonly com common component of HIPAA that affects healthcare workers is the administrative, administrative simplification subsection, which has the privacy and security. Remember, compliance is a facility-wide effort. And with all of this, HIT has a huge role, a huge role in quality, data design, infrastructure, the ability to report and disseminate data, to control privacy, to control security and access, to maintain the security in all forms including technical, administrative, and physical. So again, be sure you read or take a look at some of the Code of Ethics that would refer to you by Ahima and Hitsip on their websites and also um, look at that matrix of all of the things that someone in your position would be asked to be responsible for in, um, in the matrix that I put on the resources. And thanks. Good luck with your discussion forum, and I'll see you all on Friday.